Okay. Today is one five fifteen twenty fifteen. It's weird to write that. Okay, so we had said there were three kinds of bonding, ionic, covalent, metallic. Now, if you look at this periodic table, the metals we're talking about here are the transition metals. So these are these folks out here in the middle, the, the sort of middle lands. And if you remember, let's take um, titanium as an example. Titanium has 22 electrons, and it is in period 4, group 4. Okay. So we can cheat. We can do this really easily and write the electron configuration for titanium. What no, If we just want to do noble gas, what noble gas would be used for titanium? Argon. Yep. So it would be argon, and then we drop down and we start filling 4s. We fill that. And then we go to 3d, and we end up with two electrons in the 3d. Okay. Well, a couple things happen. So you've got two electrons bouncing around in that D subshell. When there's room enough for 10, there's a lot of empty space. And also because the 4S and 3D are real similar in terms of their energy levels, things tend to move around. What happens is what we call delocalization. So if something is localized, it's pinned to a specific area. Um, you may have actually heard this on TV weather news. They'll say, you know, localized showers today. And what that means is there are very distinct local spots that are going to have showers and every place else is fine. Okay, it's pinned to a geographic area. When we talk about electrons, if they're localized, they are pinned to their position in, a, in an orbital. If they're delocalized, they have ended up, they've started to move around a little bit. And what happens with all of these transition metals is the electrons end up sort of floating around the orbitals, because those orbitals are all overlapped and they're real similar in energy. So you may even get s orbitals that get involved in bonding, um, and, and in titanium specifically they do. Um, you get both d and s orbitals involved in bonding, and you get electrons that are moving all over the place. It's a little chaotic. What this looks like when you put a bunch of, and we'll stick with titanium, a bunch of titanium atoms together, is you have all these little positive nuclei, these, you know, the central portion of these atoms, and these delocalized electrons just kind of run amok. And they fill all this space. They're traveling back and forth between the different atoms, they're traveling back and forth between different orbitals. Um, you know, it's like a family with 25 first cousins and nobody's really sure, you know, yeah, I don't know, there's a pack of kids, we're not sure whose is what, just grab the kid you find. It's, it's that kind of arrangement. These things are, are flowing all over the place. And it's literally called a sea of electrons. That's the terminology we'll see used again and again and again. Now, here's what that does. So this little positive nucleus and this little positive nucleus and this little positive nucleus, they are attracted, oops, to every electron out there. So you have forces of attraction running every which way. And those electrons are attracted to all those positive nuclei. So again, you have forces of attraction running every which way. So you've got lots and lots. Remember when we talked about ionic compounds and you had forces of attraction running um, in a lot of directions? from each cation, each anion. Well, it gets even crazier here because these things are running in every direction. So if you were a betting person, would you bet that transition metals would have, and you can point, high or low melting points? And I think your life experience will teach you a little bit of this too because if I gave you a chunk of iron and a saucepan and an electric stove, I don't think any of you serious, seriously believe that you could produce molten iron on your stovetop at home. I hope not. So, yeah. 
they have very high melting points because they've got these really strong forces of attraction running in multiple directions. There are a few other things that this causes. I, I think you figured it out. I guess I didn't say it explicitly. This type of bonding is called metallic bonding. So it's the bonding model in which you hear the term sea of electrons. That's metallic bonding. So we're talking here only about metals bonding with other metals of the same kind. Um, well, not necessarily the same kind, but other transition metals. So alloys. If you make an alloy of two metals, if you melt down copper and gold and make an alloy of copper and gold, what is holding those atoms together is still metallic bonding. If you form a compound with iron and oxygen, that is not metallic bonding because you've got a metal and a nonmetal. So metallic bonding is occurring in really specifically in the transition metals in the transition metals. Now, what this does, so let's borrow a section of this. Copy it, paste it. If you think back to our ionic compounds, we said ionic compounds were these nice orderly lines of opposing charges that are locked into this very rigid geometry because of attraction and repulsion. So salt is an example. And we said if you take a hammer, there's my hammer, it's not a very good hammer, it's actually a pretty terrible hammer, but it's the best we get, and we hit this chunk of salt, what happens to all the lines of attraction here? They all shift down, and now those are no longer forces of attraction, but forces of repulsion, and it shatters. And sure enough, if you hit a chunk of salt with a hammer, it shatters. Pieces fly everywhere. Now, over here, If I hit this with a hammer, there, that's a better hammer. If I hit this with a hammer, are these so rigidly fixed and locked, and there's my shatter line, that just shifting the atoms is going to cause it to shatter? No. Those electrons just swim around a little bit more. They, they you know, tweak themselves, and everything's back to a good arrangement where there's lots of forces of attraction at work. So if you take a metal and strike it with a hammer, it doesn't shatter. What property of metals have you learned every single time you've talked about chemistry? Um, malleable. We can pound them into sheets. Guess why we can pound them into sheets? Because we can keep hitting them with a hammer. There are still all these forces of attraction running in all directions through them. We can pull them into wires. Same thing. So it's actually, and I, I actually I find this fascinating, the way something behaves in the real world, something you can touch, feel, I mean, you can, I can hand you a hammer and a chunk of copper and send you out on a nice hard surface and you can pound that puppy flat. And that's all because of how the atoms are arranged. I find that fascinating, you know, that it, it's a reflection of some deeper truth at an atomic level. I just find that mind-blowing you're seeing evidence of how atoms are arranged. Ooh. So anyway, there's something else this does for us. What's another characteristic of metals that you've known about since forever? Ah, oh, they're great conductors. They're fantastic conductors. They are such good little conductors. Yes, they are. So let's borrow all of this. Not all of it, just copy. Paste. Okay, and we're going to make this into a sheet of metal. I don't know what kind of sheet of metal, but it's some kind of sheet of metal. Sea of electrons. Okay, so now I need five electrons. I often pick on my front row. I could pick on my back row. Okay. Jacob, Claire, Ashlyn, Sam, and we'll add Ella because we need five. Stand up, folks. 
Metals are conductive specifically because the electrons are free to move. When you add an electron here, one will jump off here. And that's because of this sea of electrons. They're also conductors of heat because you've got actual physical pieces of matter that are in constant motion. We know atoms are in constant motion. But because of the ability of those electrons to move, they can actually transfer. All, all that heat is, you know this, I think, is kinetic energy. It's how fast the particles are moving. Well, these particles are very free to move. So in a metal, when you apply heat, when you speed up the particles on one end, it transfers that through very well. Okay? So this basically sums up the next slide we have about these. Oops. So that's what we just explained. It's the delocalized electrons that allow metals to be such good conductors. It's the delocalized electrons and that sea of electrons that's involved in bonding that allow metals to be pounded out into sheets, pulled into wires. Um, you know, and again, I find it amazing. The characteristics we observe at the macro level are reflections of deeper truths at the atomic level. I think that should be printed on a t-shirt. So we're going to talk about molecular geometry. You may have noticed that your lab that you're starting tomorrow is called the Molecular Geometry Lab. They're connected. Um, and I should actually draw your attention to your learning goals for this week. So number two, we've really mostly covered, but we'll t we talked a little bit more about it um, in terms of metallics, uh, distinguishing between different kinds of compounds based on their properties, explaining why differences in how compounds behave exist based on their attractions and repulsions at the atomic or molecular level. And number one, and I misspelled Vesper, I apologize, is to use Vesper theory to predict molecular geometries. <coughs> so we're going to talk about molecular geometry, we're going to talk about what Vesper theory is, and we should basically get to a point today where you'll, it'll be easy for you to pick up with the lab tomorrow and start doing the sort of action work of building compounds. So not only does how the electrons are arranged in a particular atom cause it to behave a certain way, but how molecules are shaped can cause them to behave in a certain way. Um, we've talked a lot about this little friend of ours who can name this molecule. Water! And we know that Mickey has some, some funky things going on here. The hydrogens look like ears, and then we've got these unshared pairs of electrons down on the chin. So in addition to the fact that oxygen is an electron hog, it's actually got these unshared pairs. So it's got a very negative area here and, and positive areas up here. That changes how it behaves. And molecular polarity, actually, this uneven distribution of charge, is one of the primary things that causes things to behave in different ways. So whether something is polar or nonpolar. Now here's, here's something to consider. How many of you in biology got to watch a movie called Photo 51, The Secret of DNA. Okay, it's about a woman named Rosamond Franklin. And Rosamond Franklin, um, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, did some of the first work with getting direct evidence of the shape of the DNA molecule. Watson and Crick were over in another lab just making wild guesses and Rosman was very methodically, you can think of it as taking photographs, she was actually bouncing x-rays through a diffraction grating and the shape, the pattern that was formed by the x-rays on special paper once it passed through the substance gave her hints about the shape of the molecule. And it was all down to knowing that there, you know, knowing that you were looking at carbon and nitrogen and hydrogen and oxygen, knowing what the chemicals were, and knowing that you could, from the fact that this was a carbon-nitrogen bond, figure out what this angle was, or figure out that because that was a carbon-hydrogen bond. It was years of painstaking, hand-done mathematical calculations. I mean, the woman had some serious chops because she was doing calculations by hand, not even with a scientific calculator. I mean, we're talking about slide rules here. You don't even know what a slide rule is. 
it's a weird primitive device that allows you to do complicated math um, using logarithms. Yikes, it's horrible. Um, by hand, for every single atom in that molecule. Now, if you want to get all those molecular geometries, you stick a sample in a tube, you stick it in a machine, you close the machine, you hit a button, it goes, Vroom! and up on a computer screen pops the entire molecular structure with all of the atoms labeled and all of the angles labeled. Because all a computer is, and I don't know if you're aware of this, is a super rapid calculator. All a computer can do is add and subtract. Actually, just add. They just add a lot. And they do it really, really fast. So whether you're sending an email or a photo or you're playing, I don't know what you play these days, Angry Birds, I don't know, that's probably so last year. But um, whatever you're doing on the little computers that you're carrying in your pockets or whatever else, all you're doing is rapid arithmetic computation. And so those painstaking calculations that took Rosamund Franklin years to do can be done in a matter of minutes. Boop, it's done. There you go. Oh, there's your picture. When, you know, so prior to the late 1940s, early 1950s, we didn't have really reliable ways to figure out molecular structure other than guessing. And Rosamund Franklin really came along and revolutionized a lot of this because she started using x-ray diffraction to get pictures of structure. And so this is kind of groundbreaking, especially for big molecules. We're not doing any really big molecules. We're doing some pretty simple, small molecules in here. If you go on to take chemistry in college, especially organic, you will do big, crazy molecules. That's why you should get yourself a kit. But figuring out geometry of any molecule, if you discover a new substance, so you are in charge of the geochemistry on the new Mars mission, and you come, and you know, you come back with a sample that is a previously unknown compound. You can figure out the, the molecular structure of it and how it will behave um, by testing it. You know what I'm talking about now is you know pop it in, close the button, hit go, um, and also model making. And you can think about how electrons and protons, how electron clouds and little positive nuclei are going to interact because they're going to force a molecule to be in a certain shape. So Vesper theory, valence shell electron pair repulsion. All we're saying here, and you've known this forever, is that two positive charges will repel and opposite charges will attract. That's all we're saying. What that means, if we think back to Mickey, our little water molecule, with those unshared pairs on the chin. Now, this is a great model set. This is one of the better ones I've ever seen. Because we have these little brown things that we can use. And these little brown things represent unshared pairs. Okay? So here we have so the, basics, the, the basics of Vesper theory. If you've got two things that are primarily protons, they want to be as far away from one another as possible. If you've got clouds of electrons that are unshared, they want to be as far away from one another as possible. If you've got a, pro, a little positive nucleus surrounded by an electron cloud, it wants to be as far apart from anything it's not directly bonded to as possible. So if we think about water, H2O, Here's my O. Here's my oxygen. And each of these is a hydrogen, and we have little bonds attached to them. So if I were imagining how this might go, there's an oxygen with one hydrogen. Well, if I want to get this as far away from the other one as possible, shouldn't it be over here? Those two hydrogens are not bonded to one another. I know it's hard to see around my fat fingers. Sorry. I'm doing the best I can. Um, they're not bonded to one another. They don't have any need to be interacting. And here you've got a, you know, a single proton, in this case, a positive nucleus, surrounded by um, 
some electron cloud, not a lot, because oxygen's an electron hog. And you got this other one, so we would think they would end up like that. Well, let's think about the other thing that's going on with this, with this here oxygen. It's got two clouds of electrons. Huh. So that would be as far apart as they could be, right? Hmm. Interesting. Well, before we go back to that, let's let's look at some actual examples, shall we? So the big thing is they all want to be as far apart as possible. What this ends up implying is that you have if you have two things that are bonded together, and I'll take as an example two hydrogens that are bonded together. Because H2 happens all the time. Two hydrogens sharing two electrons. Well, if you have two things, what's the farthest apart they can be? Straight line. So this is a linear compound. Um, and really all diatomics are linear. Um, diatomic molecules tend to end up being linear because that's as far apart as you can get from the other thing. Now, what if you've got something like ozone? So ozone, if you recall, is three oxygens. And, oh, I shouldn't do that one. Yes, yes, I will. But maybe I'll save. No, I won't. Um, well, we could look at carbon triple bonded to carbon bonded to hydrogen. We'll ignore the fact that there's another hydrogen there. Um, if we have carbon that's bonded to another carbon, the farthest apart that they can get is to be in a straight line from one another. I picked the wrong one. The farthest they can get apart is a straight line. And the farthest that that hydrogen can get away from the two of them is also a straight line. So we end up with something that looks like this. That's linear as well. So anything that's got three atoms, that's going to be linear. Now, what if we have four atoms bonded together? That's as far apart as they can get from one another. We call this shape trigonal planar. So the word trigonal makes you think what? Triangle. Planar means that they are all on one plane. If you look at these sideways on, they're in a flat plane. They're roughly two, they're basically two dimensional. So I'll send that one around. So if you've got four atoms, just four atoms, what you end up with is a trigonal planar shape. Now, methane, one of my personal favorites, cow farts, methane. Good stuff, good stuff. Methane is one carbon attached to four hydrogens. So we have CH4. And you've drawn this Lewis structure a number of times. We draw the Lewis structure like that. But remember, that's a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional thing. So what's the farthest apart that they can really be? Is it all spread out like that? No. It's like this. That is the maximum distance they can get from one another on both the x and the y axis. So we'll send this around. That there is a cow fart, folks. Enjoy. I like to ruin things for people. Um, that's called a tetrahedral structure. Okay. And anytime you've got five atoms attached to a, four atoms attached to a central, so a total of five atoms, you're going to see something tetrahedral. Now here's the weird bit. Let's get back to our our little conundrum with the water. We said that the furthest apart 
these two hydrogens could be is that straight line. But we know that water doesn't look like that. <coughs> so what's causing water to look so weird? Well, those unshared pairs on the central atom push those hydrogens down. This is the same arrangement as the tetrahedral except in place of two of these atoms we have unshared pairs. Thing is, they behave the same way. So an unshared pair affects molecular geometry just like having an atom that's bonded here would. Now, that said, we don't care about unshared pairs out on the peripheral atoms. Don't care, doesn't affect the molecular geometry. We only care about unshared pairs on the central atom. So what we end up with, with water, is what's called bent geometry. And basically what happens, if you're looking at something, and I'll give you an, an even better example. So let's say you're, you're testing some substance, it's unknown to you, but you know that there's a central um, atom and that there are three things attached. It's got a total of four atoms. But instead of looking like this and being planar, it looks like this. What the heck? What could cause such a thing? That. That's what causes it. So you have an unshared pair up here that's pushing all of these guys down. And we call this pyramidal. So in a pyramidal structure, if you imagine putting um, sort of walls <laughs> over these, then what you have is a little pyramid. This is called bent, because what the geometry, the name of the geometry reflects just how it looks with the atoms. It doesn't, you can't see these. You know, you don't see the unshared pairs. So what you see is the atoms. Well, rather than being a straight line, this appears to be bent. And in fact, water is a bent molecule. Um, I'm trying to think what would be a good example of pyramidal. And I'll think of one. But it ends up in this form. So it gets bent downward, and that's because of these unshared pairs. Okay. So this is the last thing we'll talk about before we just start talking about the lab itself. Um, hybridization is something that we will actually talk about after you do this lab. It's a strange concept that kind of messes with what you've already learned and come to understand about orbitals. Um, basically we can make hybrid orbitals. We will do the lab and then we will talk about hybridization. A student who I had for chemistry and physics just came back and was telling me about his college chemistry experience. He took a whole year of um, gen chem and he said, yeah, you know, we talked a lot more about hybridization than we did in here. Good. We, we cover it at a fairly shallow depth because it's not something that you have to have here. So you'll be aware it exists. You'll have, you'll have a passing understanding of what it is. You'll be ready when you get to a more in-depth conversation of it to dig right in. So it's not something that we um, go into great depth with here, though. Okay. Now let's talk about the lab. We'll stop the recording.